You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. This is Living Without Lies with your host, Donna Warren. You're not alone if you've been the victim of abuse, drug usage, or rape. Living Without Lies is here to help. Listen as Donna Warren assists women across the country break the cycle and help create a new life. So now, please welcome the host of Living Without Lies, Donna Warren. Hi, folks. How are you? This is, uh, the living, this is Donna Warren, the host of the Living Without Lies program. Uh, we're coming to you today from uh, BBM Global Networks, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. Uh, I don't know about where you are in the country, but it sure has been hot here, and uh, outrageously so in some cases. You know, I feel really sorry my one daughter-in-law is a cop, and she's got to wear a bulletproof vest and this and that and yeah, out there in 100 degree weather she has my sympathy so today we are we've decided to talk about why people find it necessary or why we we listen to what other people say and determine our self-worth based on what other people think about us and this has always puzzled me you know maybe because when I was little people thought I was so terrible and horrible that it you know I figured if that's true, then what's the point? So I just ignored them when they said things like that. So what about you, Dee? What do you think about that topic of determining our self-worth based on what other people think? I think it's good. I think it's an important subject because uh, we all do that to some extent. And uh, and we can uh, really allow it to make us feel really miserable. Uh, and something we might carry with us, you know, pretty much our whole life. Uh, there could be incidents from when we were kids, and uh, and you know, we we believe what they've said, and and uh, and we feel bad about ourselves because of it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I see a lot of that. Uh, People think that they look to other people to to value them, and I'm not sure I totally understand that. Maybe because my mother thought I was a waste of oxygen, it never occurred to me to let other people determine what I thought about myself. Because uh, you know, that just never made any sense to me. You know, the one of the reasons the Living Without Lies program is called that is because, you know, in order to to be happy and content with our life, we need to be living according to our true beliefs. We need to be pursuing something that we're interested in, and we need to be brutally honest with ourselves. Because if I want to take uh, the kudos for doing a good job and the, all the pats on the back, if I want to take you know, ownership of that, then I have to take ownership of all the times I screw up, all the times I fail, all the times I do things wrong. And when things go wrong in my life, I need to look at what my part was, what part I played in it. Because trust me, in most cases, we play a part in the things that happen in our lives. I mean, my favorite example was that massacre out in Las Vegas at that concert. You know, the folks that got killed out there didn't do anything wrong. The part they played in that situation was they went to the concert. They weren't doing anything wrong, but if they had stayed home, they wouldn't have been killed. It's that simple. Does that make it their fault? No, but they played a part in it. Does that make sense, Dee? What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, just your talking to me helped me to, uh, you know, to understand that uh, 
you teach me a lot of things when we're just talking and things I haven't thought of before. And, I mean, well, I guess you could also call it time and unforeseen occurrence. You know, things just happen. But, but we do play a part even in that because we're just at the wrong place at the wrong time. We, you know, it, it's that type of thing where, <clears throat> where you didn't really do anything wrong, but something bad happened just because you happened to be someplace where something bad happened at that particular time. And if you had been a moment before or a moment afterward, you know, it, he wouldn't have been involved and he would have been someplace else. Yep, that's true. And, you know, we need to realize that because it just is the way it is. And, uh, and it doesn't make any sense to me to let someone else tell me who and what I am. You know, if... If I'm good at something, I I know what my limitations are. I know what my things are. And should we stop doing something simply because somebody else doesn't think we're good at it? No. Do we try to make a career out of something we suck at? No. You know, almost everybody out there, the majority of us, we can do pretty much anything we set our minds to. The question isn't how, you know, can we do something? It's how well can we do it? Now, I don't know about you, but I suppose most of the people listening here, we all sing. Most of us don't sing, you know, most of us sound decent. Some of us truly suck and sound like somebody dragging nails across across a, a chalkboard. And some people have great voices. Does that mean only the ones with great voices should sing? I don't believe that. I think everybody should. If you sound like you're scratching your nails on a chalkboard, you might want to confine your singing to the shower. Or when you're driving alone in the car. But the point is you don't stop simply because you're not good at it if you like doing it. If you like doing it. And uh, I see this with a lot of things. Uh, If we choose a career, do we choose a career only? You know, most unfortunately, too many people choose their careers based on money. But, uh, you know, if you want to be successful, you want to choose something that you at least don't mind doing. Um. Because if you hate doing something, you're not going to be very successful in it because you don't, you won't do it if you don't have to. I mean, my home is a good example of that. I hate housework. Do I, I keep it? Do I keep it clean enough not to be condemned by the health department? Yes. Do I keep it as clean as most people would like? No. I, you know, if I'm not climbing over anything and I don't think it's a, a possible source of illness, I might not bother to do it because I don't like to do it. I will if I have to, but I don't like to do it. And it sure heck wouldn't be a career for me because I hate it. And, uh, you know, this is how we have to make choices in life. Is anyone good? I have a friend. She's, in fact, she's my oldest friend. We've been friends since we were about 20, 20, 21 years old. And uh, she's a, a pianist and a good one. She never did anything with it, not even to the extent of becoming a, a, you know, a music teacher. Why? She wasn't good enough to make the Philharmonic Orchestra. Therefore, in her mind, she was a failure and sucked. You know, it was hard enough to get her to play when anyone else was around. And that's so sad because she was good. You know, she could have played in a local orchestra. She could have been in a band or just played for, you know, for fun. But she didn't because she wasn't the best. What do you think, Dee? I know you've had your problems with being perfect and being the best. So what do you think about all that? Well, um, I can remember that um, that I was in uh, a church choir. And, um, I, you, you know, you had to try out for it. They didn't just, you know, let anybody, you know, be a part of that. And so I had to have been, you know, good enough to have been accepted. But and I'd been it for quite some time, and then all of a sudden, uh, I was kicked out because I was told that I couldn't carry a tune or something. And um, and I think ever after that, um, you know, I I I I just didn't sing anymore. I, I just and I I loved it to sing, and so uh, yeah, uh, that was one example. Uh, I had other examples. Of, uh, playing the piano and things like that too um, but I think we have to go to a break right now yes we do uh, so 
Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, you know, give us a holler at 866-451-1451. Text me at 732-995-3969. Leave us a message on the radio station's website, and we'll be back in a few. Intergenerational programming is uniting America due to the tireless efforts of Dr. Ramona Frischman. Retired from the Miami-Dade County Public School System, Dr. Frischman continues to develop intergenerational learning programs aimed to improve the lives of children, young adults, and seniors through unique strategies and public policy in order to establish a mutually supportive agenda. She views intergenerational programs as a resource for policymakers and the general public on economic, social, and personal initiatives that govern our society. Her work bridges the generational gap, providing many individuals the opportunity to explore areas of common ground and celebrate each other's diversity. Contact Ramona Frischman at RamonaLong at AOL.com or visit www.gu.org to learn more about intergenerational programming. Abuse happens every moment of every day. According to national statistics in the United States, every two minutes someone is sexually assaulted and every 10 minutes a report of child abuse is made. Those currently struggling with abuse, or if you know someone who has been the victim of abuse, you are not alone. Whether physical, mental, emotional, or sexual, no, there is hope. There is help. There is healing. Author Tammy Hall has written a book from her own account of abuse called Journey of Courage that can guide you through your own personal journey of healing. Stop struggling through life. It's your story. It's your healing, and it can begin with the first turn of the page. Visit www.journeyofcourage.com to begin your path to becoming the person you were ultimately created to be, healed, hopeful, happy. Welcome back, folks. Uh, Before the break, we were talking about, you know, letting other people tell us what, what to think of ourselves and telling us to do things that we don't want to do or that we don't like to do. And uh, that's not a good thing. And unfortunately, it happens a lot. Uh, I see a lot of the, you know, the drug problems that are going on out there. Why are people using drugs besides the fact that their peers are doing it for the young people? But why are they using drugs? Because they feel unworthy. It makes them feel better. They don't feel as down on themselves. Uh, lack of self-esteem and lack of a sense of worthiness is a big problem among people today in general. You know, and why aren't we worthy? What is it about us that's, that doesn't deserve anything decent? You know, I know that uh, a lot of people tried to convince me of that when I was younger, that because I did things that were wrong and that I, you know, I had a hearing problem and I talked funny you know, and uh, all these other things that I was useless, worthless, and no good. You know, um, I didn't totally buy that because I knew I was good at some things, if not everything. I was certainly good at some stuff. And ultimately, uh, you know, I discovered alcohol first. You know, growing up in an Italian family, wine was a typical part of a meal. Alcohol was commonly used and readily available to us. And I found out that I didn't feel quite as bad. I felt a little better about myself. So that was a good thing for me. And later, but uh, see, you know, when you're a 10 or 11-year-old kid, you smell like you've been drinking. Adults have a problem with that. I can't imagine why, can you? You know, they had a problem with it. So that's when I discovered drugs. And for me, the drugs, you know, solved my problem. My problem was I didn't feel like I deserved anything good because that's what everyone was telling me, that I was worthless, useless, no good. And I didn't like that, and I didn't believe that, and I didn't want to believe it. You know, maybe part of me did, but I didn't want to believe it. Well, first with the alcohol, I found out that I'd feel a little better about myself, and then when I started with the drugs, I, but I was getting in trouble because I smelled like alcohol. And uh, with the drugs, then nobody knew I was doing that. Nobody was aware of the fact that I was using it. And it just made me not care what other people thought. It made me not care about it. 
And for me, that was the solution to my problem. And in my experience, all addiction, no matter what you're addicted to, all addiction is a solution to a problem. Usually it because it makes us feel better about ourselves. You know, or some, in my case, a lot of my problem besides feeling like uh, as I got older, my problem was more a case of staying alive and not getting myself killed. So there I was dealing with fear. The drugs and alcohol minimized my fear. They didn't make it go completely away, but they made it less of a problem. What about you, Dee? How did feeling worthless and useless, how did that affect you and what did you do about it? Oh, gosh. Um well, I, I pretty much have felt that uh, all of my, my, my childhood and the whole time that I lived with my parents. Uh, and and kind of like you, I mean, you, you know that that isn't really totally true because there are things that you can do that you can do quite well. And it, it's very hurtful. Uh, and, um, and, and so it really uh, colored well, I mean, I guess even in my adult life, I've I've always had this undercurrent of not really feeling, you know, worthy or good enough, and um, and I guess one of the big things I tried to do was stay as far away from my mom as I possibly could, um, and uh, I think I've told you too. I, I turned to religion and, and I blocked stuff out um, because it was just too too very painful to remember um but um uh, one thing i we were talking before about you know when people tell you you know uh stuff like my mother told me that if i didn't learn how to play the piano uh, i would never be popular and i don't know i i don't think i ever was really popular i don't really remember um, but I also knew at the time n- nobody was was playing the piano. People were playing guitars. You know, maybe when my mom was younger, uh, you know, when she was young, that people would, you know, gather around the piano and play and, and sing songs and stuff like that. But uh, that certainly wasn't uh, an experience that I was, you know, facing uh, with the people, you know, young people uh, that that I knew. Um, but, um, I could have easily allowed that to, you know, (laughs) to make me believe that there was something wrong with me if I didn't play the piano. Yeah, I never had anything like that said to me particularly. Um, but yeah, it, it does affect us and what we tell people and, you know, uh, it, it affects us and we think, you know, like I said, if... Uh, like I put in my book, The Seven Basic Rules of Living Without Lies, that if a, a father tells a son that the boy's stupid when he's growing up, there are two people on this planet that will that will believe that that boy is stupid. The boy and his father will both believe he's stupid. And the simple fact of the matter is neither one of them is right. Neither one of them is correct. You know, we're not all one thing. Most of us, have, we all have abilities. We have all have talents. You know, we have things we're good at. There are some of us we have things we're good at that we don't like to do, so we're not going to do them. You know, I tell my students all the time that the way to have a successful career is really so simple, everybody overlooks it. It's simple. Find something that you're good at, that you like to do, and that somebody will pay you to do. And the reason why that works, if it's something you you like to do, nobody has to force you to do it. You'll do it because you want to. And the more you practice it, the better you're going to get at it. It's that simple, and you'll be good at it, which means you'll be good enough. Now, the problem I see out there is everybody wants to be the best. Like my friend, I felt that was such a waste of talent and ability. She never did anything with her musical talent simply and solely because she couldn't be the best. She couldn't be the best. You know, she couldn't be the best. And that's so sad. You know, uh, not everybody's a superstar. Not everybody can be a superstar. Should we try something to see if we're good enough to do it? Sure. Like my favorite example of that, of course, is Michael Jordan. Excellent basketball player, probably one of the best basketball players in the world. 
when he decided to play baseball and he made he did make it to a farm team. He was good enough for that, but he wasn't good enough to go on to a major league team. And after a while, he quit playing. You know, he dropped off the team because he realized he wasn't good enough to go major. He played very well, well enough to make it to, a, uh, you know, a farm team, but not well enough to go on to the things. The last time I heard, he's now playing golf and he plays in pro-am tournaments and he's not bad, but he's not going to be a golf star either. You know, so, you know, what do you think about that, Dee? Well, as, you know, if you can do something well enough that, that you uh, that you it's something you enjoy, uh, you get pleasure from it, and you can do it fairly well, well enough so that you you know don't you feel bad about it, then then you know just enjoy you know being able to do that. I think that's wonderful. And, All and right, we should, uh, Dee, but, I'm going to break but, in because I was told we uh, have to go to a commercial. And we'll finish this when we come back. So keep what you were saying in your mind there. Folks, uh, we have to go to a commercial. Um, call us at 866-451-1451. Uh, text me at 732 uh, Or leave us a message on the blog on the website. And we'll be back in a few. My Dreams, My Challenges, and Joys is an inspiring book by author Linda Genazzo. This real-life account of raising a child with autism from birth to adulthood takes you on a journey of compassion, love, and hope as it tells the incredible story of a devoted family and their beloved daughter. Together, they faced adversity and never stopped believing they would find the help they were seeking. A breast cancer survivor, Linda Genazzo has a giving heart. With a background in social work with the mentally ill and the homeless, Linda continues to help families in her community. And her book, My Dreams, My Challenges and Joys, brings greater awareness to autism and those families in need. To purchase your copy, visit www.lindagenazzo.com. It's also available on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. Don't delay. Get your copy today. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from Francis. International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866 244 5679 and feel the glory. Welcome back, folks. Before the break, um, I had asked you a question about I had been talking about Michael Jordan and, you know, his baseball versus uh, his basketball versus his baseball. And now that he, he plays golf and ask her what she thought about, you know, people doing stuff like that. So, do you want to pick up where you left off? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You don't have to, you know, be perfect at something to really enjoy it. If you've got uh, a natural talent and you can feel really good about what you're doing, uh, you really should. It's, it would, it's really a shame, you know, for people who feel that, you know, that they would have to be the very best. And I think often it's our parents who, you know, are trying to instill that in us and uh, it causes us to really miss out on a lot of different experiences because we we believe that we can't do it uh, without really giving it a good try, without really, uh, you know, learning the skills. Uh, we, we just have this feeling that if we don't take off almost immediately with something that there's something wrong with us. And, and uh, sometimes, you know, it takes effort, it takes practice. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. That's part of the learning process. And uh, 
we, we really shouldn't limit ourselves uh, to different experiences just because we have believed that we're not good at, you know that we're not going to be perfect or or good at it. And um, again, that example about we are uh, about singing because I, I was good at singing, and I'm finally getting beginning to get my voice back after all these years as far as as singing because I <laughs> I believed you know that I couldn't and. But yet, I do know that when I was younger, I I was I did very well. Uh, I don't want to be a professional singer, but uh, I enjoyed singing enough that I, you know, that I would would just you know sing around the house or or something like that. So, um, but but I just stopped singing because someone had told me that you know I I I, I was a problem in the uh, in the church choir. Um, so we we can we can do those things to ourselves, and um, and so I'm just really encouraging people to to try things and give give yourself uh, enough time uh, and effort into something before you just say, well, well, I can't do it. You know, it, we can enjoy our life so much more. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, so many of us are raised to believe that we have to, have to be perfect. And then we have a generation of parents today whose children are the teenagers and whatnot today. Most of them were raised, you know, believing that they had to be perfect to do anything. And they raised their children. They, they're the ones who gave their children participation trophies. If they just showed up, they got a trophy, even though they didn't do anything to deserve it. And so we have two generations there, one that believed they had to be perfect to do everything, the other that didn't see any reason why they should bother to get better at good things because they'd get the rewards no matter what. What do you think about that? Well, that, that isn't a good thing either. Uh, and, uh, and kids can tell, you know, whether they really deserve something or not. And although they may feel like, wow, they got a trophy, but it does, certainly doesn't have the meaning as if you truly earned it and um, and I think it can really be confusing and even detrimental uh, to people if, if they you know feel that you know, that, that they that they've got something really for nothing it, it really isn't going to give them the, the, the uh, I guess well you can say drive uh, the willingness to you know to uh, learn and to uh, be able to really um, do well at something and uh, make it hard to really tell what they're good at and what they aren't if they whatever they do they just get a prize for it so I and I think you have a lot to say on that too um, and uh, it's just uh, it's not something that's beneficial no, I think part of that business with the participation trophies is why so many young people today like the idea of socialism, because isn't that what the participation trophies were, a form of socialism? All people had to do is show up, and they got the same no matter if they were good at it, if they sucked, if they were like on a sports team, they could sit on the bench the whole season and never once play because they weren't good enough to play against another team, but they got the same trophy as the guys who were good. So, you know, that's the, isn't that the concept of socialism? Everybody gets treated the same no matter what they do? I don't know. Uh, you know, but all of us have abilities, and we have to allow people to try. And we have to stop making trying something new, you know, such a horrible concept. I mean, we're talking about most people believe if they don't do something right, it's bad enough if they don't do it right, period. But if they, a lot of people, if they don't do it right the first time out, they're a failure and useless and all that good crap. Uh, or they believe that, uh, you know, if they do try something and they're not good at it, then, then they, they are a failure. Not that they failed at doing something, but that they themselves are a failure. And that's all coming from the idea that we need to be perfect. And, uh, for those of you who are religious, I don't know of any religion that says human beings are perfect. Don't know any of them that preach that. 
They, you know, we are flawed by nature. And just think, think what this world would be like if everyone had exactly the same abilities. How boring would life be? In fact, for that matter, could we even survive? Could we even survive if we all had the same talents and abilities? And I just got told, you know, that we have to go to commercial again. So let's do that and come back. And in the meantime, during the commercial, think about, could we survive as a species if we all had exactly the same abilities? Now, if you want to talk to us, you know, call 866-451-1451, text me at 732-995-3969, or leave us a message on the website blog under the show programs page, and we'll be back in a few. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Stapula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Weight No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Weight No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Weight No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Weight No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. Welcome back, folks. Before the break, I was talking about the fact and asking you to think about the question. If all of us had exactly the same skills and abilities, would we be able to survive as a species? In order to survive, we have to be able to get food, food and water, not die in the cold, survive both heat and cold, survive being killed by other animals, since we make a t- there are many creatures out there that would consider us a tasty snack. And, uh, you know, could we do this? Would we survive as a species? You know, because in order to, we're not, we don't run, you know, among animals, we're one of the slowest ones out there for running. We can't run down a, you know, I don't know anybody who can run fast enough to run down and catch a rabbit. You know, uh, and if we can't run and catch the bigger animals, can we wrestle them to the ground and succeed in killing them? In fact, if we hadn't, our teeth and claws are a joke for being predators. If we hadn't uh, discovered sharp rocks and figured out how to make knives and something that could cut, would we even be able to, even if we succeeded in killing a large animal, would we be able to get the hide off enough to be able to actually eat them? Would we survive? What do you think, Dee? I, I can see very clearly we wouldn't. Uh, and, and I really like your points of view because you studied uh, anthropology and so many things we take for granted because we're living in such a different time. But uh, probably most of us wouldn't be here, you know, if, um, you know if, if we hadn't learned how to do those different things and had different people who actually learned how to do them well enough to keep everybody else as a society going. Uh, and it would be the same thing too as you know the homemakers because they you know they would they would help you know prepare the food and and um, help keep those who were out 
uh, hunting for the food and stuff like that and protecting them, uh, keeping them strong so that they could they could keep everybody else going. So um, I, I find it very fascinating when you talk about stuff like that because it gives us perspective that, uh, you know, we don't really see today. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, just simple things like you said, uh, if it if we all had the same abilities in order to survive, we'd have to be able to hunt. And the ones who couldn't hunt and couldn't figure out how to get the skin off an animal they wanted to eat, you know, uh, they wouldn't survive. So only the people that were good at hunting would survive. But then we wouldn't have they they may or may not have uh, de- used, decided to use fire on their food. You know, we discovered these things as they happened to happen. You know, lightning would strike, cause a fire. Animals would get caught in it and be cooked. When our ancestors found them, they took that sharp rock that they found and cut the skin off of it and found out they liked it cooked. So they started figuring out how to cook it and what have you. We learned to do a lot of things over time, but if we hadn't done that, would we have survived? Do you think we could survive today if we all have the same skills? You know, it it doesn't work out. It, It works out that the people who are the best at something usually teach those who aren't how to at least do the thing. We don't have to be, I don't have to be the best hunter in the world to survive. I have to be able to kill something so I can eat it, but I don't have to be able to hunt down the biggest game and have the biggest prizes and trophies. I just have to have be able to kill enough food for me to survive, for me and any children that I have so that we survive. And people don't stop and think about that. All these other things, most of these other things we look at, uh, we're so used to being able to survive with little or no effort, I mean, other than working and making money so we can buy food. We've forgotten that there were skills involved in all of these things that have made this possible for us. With technology today, there's a lot of things that were totally, we take things for granted today that 20 years ago didn't exist. Is that good or bad? It just depends. But the point is, we don't have to be the best at anything in order to be able to do it, enjoy it, use it, benefit from it, etc. What do you think, Dee? I agree with you. And, I mean, even, uh, you know, if we didn't have people who were were um, uh, were doing were, were collecting garbage, I was I was thinking cleaning the streets. But I mean, that was a long time ago. I don't think I've ever seen anybody. I don't live in the city anymore. So, but but I know there was a time when there were street cleaners. You know, they they had these big these machines with big brushes, and they would clean the streets. And uh, and I mean, if we didn't have people doing all the things that need to be done, you know, it would be a mess. And, and you know, so whatever it is that needs to be done, uh, to me, the, the thing would be uh, to learn to do it, you know, to be the very best at it, you know, and find ways to make even something that might seem tedious uh, fun, you know, try to, uh, and, and, you know, try to innovate, try to, you know, figure out better ways of doing it. Uh, uh, you know, you could, you could, um, you know, kind of uh, make do um, games with yourself. And just try to find ways to do it the the best, the most efficient, uh, and uh, and and that way, you know, you, you you can you can do different things to make even something that isn't that interesting, you know, a lot more interesting. And in the meantime, as you're doing this. Uh, and and maybe you would be doing it at the same time you would be uh, saying things or doing things that would be upbuilding to uh, the people you work with. Uh, I mean, there's just so many things that we can do instead of just saying, oh, well, I have to you know, keep doing the same thing over and over again the very same way. You know, we can use our minds to, to try to make it fun, to make it interesting, to, um, to make it motivating, uh, to improving the way things are done. All right. We we need to go to a commercial, but I do want to make, make one statement before we do that. The reason we have all the technology and stuff that we have today, folks, is simply because human beings are basically lazy. We are always looking for an easier, faster, better way to do things so we don't have to work so damn hard. 
Now, if you want to talk to us, call 866-451-1451. Text me at 732-995-3969. Leave us a message on the website blog under our program, and we'll be back in a few. Psychologist, master certified coach, and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching, and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents and their staff and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interests through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Welcome back, folks. Uh, we were talking about why people do things before. And we, we, you know, like I said, as humans, we tend to be lazy. We look for better ways to do things, easier ways. You know, there's been a lot of stuff lately on the guy that invented air conditioning, as hot as it's been lately. And you know what? He did a, you know, he did a great thing for everybody. But I guarantee you, he built that first air conditioner because he was hot and he wanted to be cooler. And he knew there had to be a way to do it. And we've all benefited from that. And we benefit constantly from people innovating and making new things. Not all inventions are good, but we do, we do you know, benefit from them. So we're thinking of all the wonderful things that human beings have accomplished. How can we really think that anyone, and I mean anyone, is useless, useless worthless, and deserves nothing good in their life? How can we say that about anyone? You know, even that guy, even some of the horrible murders and stuff that are committed. Are those people useless and worthless? No, I don't think they're worthless, but I do believe they're too dangerous to be allowed to live. I put them in the same category as I do a rabid dog or or a rabid animal. We don't kill rabid animals. Because they're evil or bad or any of those things, we kill them because they're too dangerous to allow them to live. We kill them because anyone they bite or scratch is going to end up with a disease that's still, even in this day and age, is about 60% fatal. And we, that's why. Not because of, of bad or good, but because they're dangerous. So we have people out there that are dangerous and they're too dangerous to be allowed to live. But most people are not in that category. Most people have their own abilities and talents. I think I mentioned several times on this particular show that I learned one of the most important lessons in my life from a young man with Down syndrome. You know, he could, I worked for his father. He used to deliver our mail because he could read well enough to, you know, look at the name on an envelope and look at the name on our desk or cube you know, to see who and where to deliver the mail. And I'm curious by nature, so I was curious enough to want to talk to him and find out what he could and couldn't do. And I learned something very important from him. I noticed that he was like small children. It never occurred to him that he wasn't a part of the whole. It never occurred to him that he was bad. It didn't occur to him that there was anything. He knew he had limitations, 
but he found things that he could do. And, you know, he believed that he was part of the universe, that he was whole. It never occurred to him not to be. And it dawned on me that the thing I could do that he couldn't do, I can choose to be evil. I can choose bad. I can choose to hurt other people. I can choose to hurt other people because I'm selfish. I can choose to not care about anyone but myself. I can choose to do these things. That is free choice. I can also choose to be good, to be kind, to be helpful. But I can make that decision. That young man with Down syndrome wasn't capable of doing that. Neither is a four or five-year-old. They're not capable of that. Can they do bad things? Sure. Can they hurt other people? Not they can, but they're not usually trying to do any serious harm. So what do you think, Dee? Well, I'm thinking, too, that, you know, what you're saying is particularly, you know, if a child is not badly abused, uh, you know, during that time, uh, I think when, you know, kids, I don't think any child thinks up this kind of, you know, some of the stuff that happens. Uh, I think that uh, that they have to be influenced, you know, by by someone to, you know, I don't really believe that those kinds of things come up into a child's mind, uh, and, and partially since I found out that, you know, you have to be, well, even I think it's, you, you're around six or seven before you really, you know, can even have that concept, you know, and you were kind of talking about that young man uh, with Down syndrome, and, and I, it's very possible that naturally, you know, that isn't something that, you know, somebody that the, those ages would really come up with on their own. Uh, it's just not built in them. And, and that if, if, if it does happen, it's because of outside influence. Uh, but when it isn't really until they're about um, 25, that they really can even think like an adult because their brains haven't developed that, to that point. So, um, so yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of the stuff that happens is because of, of how uh, the things that happen to them and how it influences them. And, you know, there comes points when your mind, you know, just is not working and functioning in a way that is... Um, the way it was created to. And when that happens, then, you know, things just don't work right anymore. And it doesn't yeah, mean well, that it can't be fixed in, unless you actually have uh, yeah. a, an injury to your brain physically that would keep you from doing that. If you, you know, had the right person who had the knowledge, they could help you through those things. Well, that's only partly true. There are people who are born with uh, problems. I mean, a normal a normal average five year old is totally self centered. That's perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with them. But as they get older, they begin to learn about and begin to care about other people. But there are people born who have are incapable of empathizing with others. We call them sociopaths. They haven't got the ability to care about anyone else. They are the children who are busily torturing animals, killing them, and doing that sort of thing. They were born defective. You know, if you want to say, well, it's not their fault. No, it's not their fault. But they're, again, the problem is unless we can teach them not to do that sort of thing, they're basically too dangerous to be allowed to live, especially when they're allowed to come adults being that way. You know, in all the years that I was involved in the world of crime and uh, all that sort of stuff and drugs and all that sort of stuff, the only people that ever truly scared the hell out of me were the sociopaths because you never knew what they were going to do. If you had a pencil and they wanted it and you didn't give it to them, they might kill you to get it. They might not. You never could tell what they were going to do next. But there was no guarantees with them. They would do things for trivial reasons simply because you didn't do, give them what they wanted or do what they wanted you to do. I found them terrifying, and they're born that way. They're born that way. They're defective from birth. All right, we need to go to another commercial. Dee, I'll ask for your comments on that when we come back. Uh, call us at 866-451-1451. Uh, 
send me a text at 732-995-3969. And please, if you have any questions or would like us to discuss something, send me a text. Let me know what you're interested in. And, uh, you know, uh, or you can leave a message on the blog, on the, on the website. And uh, we'll be back in a few. Hi, my name is Myra Fox, and I am a survivor. I am the founder of the Castle Lewis I Survived Foundation and the author of a series of books entitled I Survived a Murder Untold, which tells the story of my sister and I who were abandoned and left in the care of a woman who beat us repeatedly. Unfortunately, it resulted in the death of my sister, Castle Lewis, which is revealed in a page-to-page chilling story. After spending time in the foster care system, I've documented my suffering and my loss and ultimately my survival. I'm blessed to work daily in my community and surrounding areas to give back by helping others and feeding the homeless. I want to spread awareness of the dangers of abuse. You can purchase my books and contribute to the Castle Lewis I Survive Foundation by visiting www.castlelewis.com or you can call us at 540-999-8401. Thank you. Are you looking for employment and live in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is the place for you. Are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is for you. Employers, JobsAnnex.com is your resource for career-minded people. JobsAnnex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at JobsAnnex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. JobsAnnex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X.com. Welcome back, folks. Before the break, we were talking, oh, I was talking about sociopaths that are born without the ability to empathize or feel anything for anyone else. And uh, the fact that they're extremely dangerous people. If, you know, I have a friend who has a son who is a sociopath. His son's an adult now. But he raised that boy from the time he realized he was one to believe that you know, to believe that he would be better off and it was in his best interest never to hurt anyone to get what he wanted. Now, that young man is very charming. He can charm the pants off of, of a gorilla. You know, he's really charming. And he gets mostly can get what he wants without hurting people. But his father worked very hard to teach him to do that because otherwise he would have hurt people. So today we've been talking about identity and about why why you want you let other people determine who you are and what you are. I know for a personal fact that there's only four or five people on this planet whose opinion of me matters to me at all. And uh, you know, it would break my heart if they didn't love and respect me, but it would not change my opinion of myself. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm bad at. I know when I'm being kind and good. I know when I'm being a selfish bitch. I know these things. You know, I'm not perfect. I sometimes choose to do things that are wrong because they're too much fun not to do. And, you know, I know all of these things. And uh, I, I know this about myself. I know who I am, and I'm brutally honest with myself. I don't have to be honest with you because it doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter to me about your opinion about me as a person is irrelevant. You're entitled to it. If you think I'm, you know, when I get patted on the back and told how great I am, I love it. You know, when I get told that I'm a stupid, hard headed, trying bitch, I I don't like that much. But okay, you're entitled to your opinion. You know, and I'll decide, and you know, sometimes that negative feedback, sometimes I'll change my behavior because when I think about what you said, I realize you got a point. I am being difficult. You know, so that helps me keep my behavior within reason. And, uh, you know, I know this is a short segment and we don't have much to say, and 
Dee, do you have anything you'd like to say that you can cut to a minute? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, I just think that, um, that it's important for us not to let other people define who we really are and and for us to learn to have uh, a very healthy uh, uh, feelings about ourselves and and other people that's it yeah oh that's it that's all you want to say yeah i agree we need to uh we need to decide who we are what we believe what we're good at what we suck at You know, things that we're not real good at, but that we like to do, you know, and that type of thing. We need to choose a career that's at least something we like doing because you're not going to be successful otherwise because you're going to hate your job. And money is not a good motivator for why you should pick a career. It's consideration. It's one of the many considerations. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I hope today we talked about some things that some folks find at least interesting if not helpful and uh, I hope you folks have a nice week a good rest of the day hopefully you won't melt that melt is in the areas of the country where it's extremely hot it's not as bad as it was last week but it's it's hot and uh, you know I, ho- I hope it's the week goes good for you you have a nice pleasant weekend and that you come back to see us again next Monday and uh, you know so folks uh, I'm going to sign off now and all I can say is uh, have a nice week God bless all of you you've been listening to Living Without Lies with your host Donna Warren contact Donna at D-L-U-H-R-S at Comcast.net Or call 732-995-3969 for information about the Living Without Lies Foundation. You are not alone on the path to building a new life. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.